I realized I can cover my bills with this. Like I don't have to go back to a corporate job. I started to discover that I was capable of earning money on my own without anyone telling me what to do, which means each passing day, the idea of applying to another job just Vanished. I realized that the amount of money that it took me years to save is equivalent to like what I'm making right now within two months. Parents didn't want me to become a chef. They wanted me to work in corporate America, do something that's very comfortable, something that's gonna pay the bills, the nine to five job, the benefits, the 401k. I was working on a startup at the time. When it ended up failing, Chess was already doing pretty well and it felt like enough for a full-time job. So I decided to take the risk and see how far it would take me. My big goal is to expand chess content to the average viewer and make it really relatable, even for people who just like to play casually. I doubled my income overnight, and that was crazy to me. At 24, 25, making 14 or 15K per month, is insane. You're not even emotionally prepared for it yet. My name is Alex Fasulo. I'm 28 years old and I make $378,000 per year as a freelance writer on Fiverr.com. I lived in New York City for the past six years and I now live in Florida. My clients vary beyond what you can imagine from large corporations that you've heard of down to entrepreneurs or influencers or people who manage their influencing dog on Instagram. I've written ebooks for quite a few dogs. I've been able to take 60 hours worth of work and kind of squish it down to 40 hours because I kind of have my system down so well. I accepted this PR job that paid $36,000 per year. I felt so out of place. I was so unhappy and I, I was crying on my keyboard that I quit. And I don't normally quit things. And that Monday when I was supposed to go into work, I just couldn't. I could not go back into that place. It was the darkest I had ever felt. I only had enough money in my bank account to cover my bills for three months. So I was thinking, oh my gosh, if I have to go through this same process again, only to get a job that I again hate, you know, I, I can't keep going through this cycle. Something needs to change. After a few days, I had interest on my press release gig and I was charging $15 for that. And just that interest alone was enough to almost kind of light a fire in me and see, okay, I am capable of earning $15, $20 a day. Well, what if I could earn $50 a day? What if I could earn $100 a day? Now I'm making $3,000 per month and I can cover all of my bills. That first week on Fiverr, I started to discover that I was capable of earning money on my own without anyone telling me what to do, which means each passing day, the idea of applying to another job just vanished. It just disappeared into thin air. I think I cried. <laughs> I realized I can cover my bills with this. Like I don't have to go back to a corporate job. After about a year of hitting it really hard on Fiverr, I opened way more services. I think I had like 12 or 13 gigs at the time. I was ranked level two on the site and the site has these levels that allow you to charge more as you advance through them. Fiverr, the company actually reached out to me and asked me to come meet them to film a commercial in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Up until January, 2018, I was making around six to eight K per month, which is incredible, of course, but it was January into February, 2018, when I was launched into the double digit realm, meaning I was making 13 K, 
14K, 15K, uh, which was essentially a complete, I doubled my income overnight and that was crazy to me. In 2017, I made $63,000 that year. And in 2018, I jumped to making $273,000, which was the craziest jump you could ever imagine. <laughs> It took me a couple years to accept that I was making that money. The only thing that I would say I started to spend more on to treat myself was travel experiences and music festivals. I'm pretty sure if a financial planner sat down with me, they would be disgusted by me and my management of my money. <laughs> but my strategy is just basically if I know I'm making like 15 to 20K, I kind of just in my head try and make sure I'm saving at least 50% of it. This year, I'm definitely gonna contribute less to my retirement, but I already know my accountant is gonna tell me that I should still contribute something because it helps with my taxable income. <laughs> I can hear them now. So I think like most entrepreneurs, I have a problem with having my money like locked up in accounts. It's just not how my brain works. I kind of like to have it at my disposal. So if I come up with some like project or real estate investment I wanna do, I can just grab it. I use a CPA, like an accountant, hands down. Costs like $1,200, it's worth it to me. When you're in a city like New York, it's very easy to go somewhere. You can drop $200 on dinner. And I think it kind of contributed to my desire to move out of New York City, which I am now in Florida. And my food and drinks is probably down to $500. It's not even close to what it was in New York City. I wanted to still be mobile and not reliant on flights to go travel and see our country. The craziest thing happened because while so many people were losing their jobs and so many businesses were going out of business, so many people were coming online to start selling products and services because that was the only way they were going to make contact with other human beings. So they needed someone like a copywriter to help them fill their website, their blog, their social media posts, which led me to having my biggest month that I have ever had on Fiverr in May, 2020. I made over $36,000 that month, which was insane. And it was so weird to have that happening while there was so much bad happening in the world at the same time. It was a very weird and conflicting feeling. I said to her, you know, hey, I have 350K chilling in my bank account. You want me to get this house and you can pay me back when you sell the Albany house? And she said, yeah, I mean, sure. So we kind of just, you know, made a collective decision. I don't know, my family, we're old school. I guess we share our resources and everything. For this house, my mom put down the $20,000 down payment and then I paid the rest, which was 287,000. And we transferred the money out of my bank account to the seller and in full paid in cash, you know, paid off. So I was never really scared, but it was definitely very new for me the last two months to live with having 20 to 30K in my bank account instead of 300K. That's gonna make me sound full of myself, but I just become very used to having a lot of money in my bank account because I had been saving it. This first property I wanna buy in Southwest Florida, um, it's cheap because it's only a one, two bedroom, tiny little thing. So I'm actually thinking of buying two of them right off the bat. One of them I would immediately start to rent out on Airbnb and then the other one I would use for myself slash a filming studio because right now I don't have one and I definitely want one set up so I'm more inclined to do YouTube content and everything I keep putting off. But until I buy that second one, I will, yeah, live in the first one.
I want to eventually quit Fiverr just because I'm, again, like that classic entrepreneurial type where I get bored. And I would love to transition more into a full-time educator with everything that I've learned and kind of phase away from actually writing the blogs and, and move more into a role where I'm helping people write blogs. I think 22 year old me working a job I hated in New York City, making $36,000 per year. I could not in my wildest dreams have imagined that this would be me at 28. Not for a second did I ever think this would be where I am. I did not dream that big. Women get treated much differently than men if they're posting about the money they earn. On TikTok, if I post a video showing my receipts, as Gen Z says, the comments are flooded with men saying, no, you don't, you know, calling me mean terms, sexual terms, or saying, oh, she made it on OnlyFans. I definitely noticed a huge pushback being a woman. And I've had all sorts of people write to me and say, it's very unbecoming as a woman that you post that money. You know, you should keep your mouth shut about it. So it's definitely hard being a woman doing this, but I think it's also forced me to develop thicker skin. Hey guys, I'm gonna give you my top five time management tips that help me churn out a ton of work every day. Got a lot of love too. And I discovered that there's so many people out there that do wanna freelance, they don't hate me for it and they wanna learn from me and they wanna learn what I know. Being transparent with what I am earning has earned these people's trust and showed them it is possible. A girl from a farm in upstate New York did it, I can do it too. Hi. Hey, hey, how? Hi, Emily. Hi, Emily, how are you nice doing? Here is the uh, influencers in the wild. <laughs> That's right. The pizza making class, Chef O experience. This is Michael O. He's a private chef from Atlanta, Georgia. You have no idea how happy I am. Since being let go from his corporate job during the pandemic, Michael has been pursuing his passion turned side hustle, cooking full time. Since then, he has more than doubled his income. The money's coming in. You know, I, 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 I can't complain. I'm actually enjoying what I'm doing. Michael has no formal culinary training. In fact, he's never even worked in a professional kitchen. But hospitality is as much about entertaining guests as it is preparing amazing cuisine. And it doesn't take long to see how his outgoing personality connects with his clients. <laughs> I enjoy meeting new people. I enjoy, you know, the satisfaction that they get from the food, you know, that I prepare for them and the experience that I bring to their home. Since going full time in 2020, Michael has been preparing about four parties per week. He also holds virtual cooking classes for big Silicon Valley corporations. We're at the final stretch. Prices vary depending on how many people and the type of cuisine they want, but usually range from $150 to $350 per person. Altogether, Michael is bringing in around $14,000 each month. I knew that I made it big when I realized that the amount of money that it took me years to save is equivalent to like what I'm making right now within two months. Michael grew up in Alpharetta, Georgia after his parents immigrated to the United States from South Korea. They want us to get into the best schools, get the best job, get married, have kids, the full nine yards. Unfortunately, I didn't live up to those expectations. He always had a passion for cooking, but his parents pushed him towards a more financially stable career. And my parents didn't want me to become a chef. They wanted me to work in corporate America, do something that's very comfortable, something that's gonna pay the bills, the nine to five job, the benefits, the 401k. Michael was working as a recruiter up until 2020 while cooking on the side, but was laid off due to the pandemic. Instead of sulking, he decided to pursue his dream and start cooking full time. But first, he had to line up some clients. It was probably the most devastating news I've ever received in my life. You know, when after when you bought a house, you have all these plans, um, what you want to do in your career. It's, it's a weird cliche, you know, what they say is you make lemonades out of lemons, you know, it's a silver lining. And I feel like, you know what? <laughs> Why not do this right now? 
Let me give this a shot. I got my severance money. Let's go ahead, let's start my business and let's thrive. So we are heading off to the Beaver Highways Farmer's Market. That's where I like to get my fresh produce. All right, you got some mozzarella cheese. Can't go wrong with that. The pandemic actually created a niche for Michael since most people were staying home and only gathering in small groups. Restaurant dining rooms weren't open, so if they wanted a culinary experience, they had to happen inside of people's homes. Michael took full advantage. You know, a lot of trips, a lot of um, parties were canceled uh, due to the pandemic. And so they realized, you know what, we want to have an intimate experience. And that's how they were able to find me on Instagram. What's up, man? How are you? Doing good, man. I gotta go with some hanger steaks, man. Michael O has never worked one day in a professional kitchen or attended any type of formal culinary training. I'm 100% self-taught. But posting his culinary creations on Instagram created a massive audience for him. I always post all these pictures. I do all these travels, kind of living like Anthony Bourdain. And one day someone reached out to me, asking me if I could be a private chef for uh, his wife and her partners. And next thing you know it, I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing, but yeah, I'll do it right away. And so that was my very first gig that I ever done on the side. After the success of that first party in 2016, his cooking gigs took on a snowball effect. One client would post on Instagram or Facebook and some of their followers would reach out. They see stories about their friends post, right? They see pictures of them being tagged and all these great experiences that they want to capture all that. How's business been, man? Pretty good. Pretty good? Really good. Oh, right. I know, man. Michael's weekends quickly filled with private parties, but even still, he made travel a priority so he could continue learning new cuisines and techniques. I'm traveling around the world and I'm acquiring a lot of knowledge. I go to Bologna, Italy, learn how to make pasta, and I fell in love with it. And I'm saying to myself, you know what? This is something I could actually do. This is something I can make a living out of. I could actually come back to the States and show people how to make pasta from scratch, bring the experience to their home. Michael still doesn't have a formal website or a booking process. The majority of his clients reach out through DM or Facebook groups. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. All righty. We're off. What I'm doing right now, you got some fresh tomatoes right here and just kind of squeezing them. Going full time proved to be lucrative for Michael, but with more parties taking place each week, soon he was being stretched too thin. He needed to bring on some help. The mangoes uh -huh. aren't really ripe here, so uh -huh. I'm just gonna get them super rich. Okay, that's fine, man. Now that Michael has extra hands, he is able to increase his catering capacity. Here we are right now in June, and I'm already booked down until November, December. You know, the weekends are all booked. Been kind of crazy. Never thought that it would be like this at all, you know. Quick, easy sauce. That's gonna be for the pizza. Hi. Hey, hey, Hi, how? Emily. Hi, Emily, how are you nice doing? To meet you. His parties are a mix of private cooking classes followed by a meal prepared by Michael and his team. Typically, the guests can learn how to prepare the appetizer, like a homemade pizza or dumplings. In this one, you could feel free to put whatever you like. I figured, like, you know, I have a little arugula that's actually with um, a little bit of truffle oil in here, too. Then, as they enjoy the fruits of their labor, Michael cooks the rest of the meal. It's like a watercress puree, which is really, really good. Oh, my God. Oh my God. I mean, like, I, look how much meat we have, guys. I'm probably not the most cheapest chef that are out there right now, but I can assure you it's, it's Michael O. It's me. Some people hate onions and cilantro, but like when they make eat, eat chimichurri, it's totally a different ball game, you know? Michael hopes to one day expand the Chef O experience. Branching off to do any different sectors, mainly getting to the catering business, uh, hosting larger parties. And although he has found financial success, he says his biggest win was combining his passion for cooking with his love of meeting new people. Obviously food is very good in every restaurant, right? But how often is it that they allow people to come over to their house, cook for them, and build that strong relationship with them? If you don't like pizza, then no, something's wrong. Something's wrong. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. Something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Being a 
chess player is very similar to being a struggling artist. If you're a grandmaster, that doesn't mean you're going to make a good living. If you're in the top 10, then maybe, but most grandmasters have to teach on the side just to be able to make it. And I knew that wasn't the kind of lifestyle that I wanted. My name is Alexandra Botez. I'm 25 years old. I'm a professional chess streamer living in Austin, Texas, and I make six figures a year. My family comes from Romania, which has a really rich chess culture, as opposed to in the US or North America, where people typically see chess as a game for nerds. My dad actually taught me how to play, and then I won my first national tournament at eight years old. My official title is Women Fide Master, which means you have 2100 Fide. My national ranking in my country that I represent is almost 2300, which is above national master ranking. Women in chess is not something very common, and it has taken us very long to get to the point where we're starting to change the stereotype that women are not genetically inferior to men at playing chess. We believe that this situation will change. I do not expect it to change to, to a proportion of uh, being an equilibrium or, or something like that. But definitely it's going to change. It, it is not a short journey. It's a long journey that will take some time. Back in college, I really loved playing chess online and it was a hobby that I also missed doing in person. So I started playing chess on chess.com and I really missed the social interaction so I just started streaming on Twitch for fun and took off from there. It was only a couple hundred viewers for the first two years or so. That being said, that was pretty significant in the chess category. I was always one of the top three streamers at you know any point in my streaming career and I had a lot of early subscribers who really helped me out to even host cash tournaments and things like that. So that actually ended up making streaming a viable career option very early on just because of how dedicated and tightly knit the chess community was and the generosity of these early donors. I was working on a startup at the time when it ended up failing, chess was already doing pretty well and it felt like enough for a full-time job. So I decided to take the risk and see how far it would take me. What are you willing to do? Uh, what are you willing to do? Um, we can do it for a dare. Sure, sure. Well, yeah. do you want to pick the dare beforehand? Let's just pick it after. Okay. And be fair. Give the person three, three options. options. Yeah. Okay. As a full-time Twitch streamer, my income comes from a lot of different sources. Part of it comes directly from viewers. Other parts come from sponsors. We also just signed with Team Envy, so now we get a salary from them as well. We also have ad revenue from different social platforms and in the future we're going to be releasing merchandise. She probably makes the similar type of income that the top professionals are from streaming chess on Twitch and she's not even ranked in the top 20,000 players in the world. So again, the definition of what a chess professional is has changed. With my first Twitch stream, I think like 60% of it was just people trying to flirt with me in chat or people just commenting on my appearance the entire time and nothing else. They didn't care about the gameplay at all. I actually stopped streaming at first because of that until I had moderators who were able to come and help clean it up. It is f hard to be a female gamer on Twitch for a lot of reasons. On one end, you can sometimes gain followers faster on Twitch, but it doesn't translate to viewers, which is what you usually monetize. That being said, there's also advantages. Because there's so many few females who actually make it, usually females on Twitch actually get paid more in terms of advertising dollars per average viewership than males, because a lot of brands want to have diversity now. 
while COVID has obviously been a really tough time for most people and for myself included, it's brought a lot of new attention to chess. When the pandemic first hit in the first two months, the amount of new users chess.com was getting every day doubled just from the impact. And since I think it's been growing even more. So it really helped explode the popularity of chess. The Queen's Gambit success was the dream of all chess enthusiasts. I've talked with so many chess players and people in the chess business space and their question to me once I started um, building a chess following was, what do we need to do to make chess more popular? My answer was always, well, we, we have to influence popular culture. So obviously this had a huge impact on the amount of people interested in chess, but also really on females who are interested in chess. I mean, the, the story of Queen's Gambit, it's, it's a story of, uh, of a full success all over the way. That is a bit of a fairy tale, which uh, almost doesn't happen or surely doesn't happen on such a scale. When I thought about my chess career, there were actually many points early on when I thought I could make a living through it. Back in high school, at around 15 or 16, I opened up a Facebook page and I would start to sell lessons online for something like $50 an hour to start just being able to get some kind of salary. So I did have some success with that early on, at least for a high schooler, you know, nothing crazy. But I never imagined it would grow to this stage. I'm happy that we have somebody like, like Alexandra because it shows you once again that chess provides you a lot of uh, opportunities you don't have to be even a grandmaster but you have to be you have to be you know an educated player because all the way through she explains and she's good enough to already to explain the subtleties and so on so so it, it, it is a good story and uh, I really like what I see and I think Alessandro would be a huge success for years to come it's just growing by the day whether that be YouTube or Twitch or other methods or selling courses on a website or whatever there are certainly thousands of people making a living in chess at this point, at least to some extent. With all of our channel's income streams, which includes me and my sister, as well as my personal investments, by the end of 2021, we'll definitely be at least in the mid six figures. I realize that I'm prioritizing chess content over competitive chess. These are two very different skills, and if I want to become a 10 times bigger content creator, then I have to learn specific skill sets that might not necessarily be studying more chess. So my big goal for 2021 is to expand chess content to the average viewer and make it really relatable, even for people who just like to play casually. Yeah.